but we don't even analyze deals that aren't in the market or micro neighborhoods that we would want to invest in. So we're looking at key metrics like you know, jobs, population, median household income, um, poverty levels, unemployment levels, these types of things. And we're looking for what we call like the Goldilocks zone um, for each of those metrics. Um, and we're, we're not even gonna analyze deals that aren't in those zones. Hello and welcome to Pillars of Wealth Creation, where we talk about creating financial success with a special focus on business and real estate. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. Now, let's get to it. Hey, our sponsor for the show today is Pine Financial Group, the leader in hard money lending in Colorado and Minnesota. And they were recently approved to offer their investment publicly. This investment offers only for investors in Colorado and Minnesota and is only made through their investment prospects. Get your copy today. Simply visit www.pineinvestments.com and click to get started. Look, there's a reason why some of the wealthiest people in history invest in loans backed by real estate. Learn more about the risks and returns at www.pineinvestments.com. Hey, welcome back to Pillars of Wealth Creation. I am your host, Todd Dexheimer. With me today, I've got Anna Myers. Anna, how are you doing today? I am doing fantastic. Thanks for having me on the show. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you joining us. So a little bit about Anna, and then I'll let you take the rest because I like to have my guests tell about themselves, but I'm going to start you off. Uh, Anna serves as vice president at Grow Capitus, a commercial real estate investment company in the San Francisco Bay Area. Anna's a, Anna is a modern entrepreneur who applies her 20 plus years of experience in technology and business to finding, analyzing, acquiring, and asset managing commercial properties in key markets across the U.S. Uh, together with her business partner, Neil Bawa, they approach real estate through a data science lens to create compelling profits for their investors. Anna, with that said, tell our listeners a little bit more about you, Grow Capitus, and what you guys are doing and what maybe sets you apart from everyone else. Sure. Well, um, first of all, just a, a little bit about my background. I am a third generation commercial real estate. Um, but as the, the youngest grandchild of uh, my grandfather, who was a commercial real estate maverick in Southern California, um, I didn't really uh, work at the real estate office or work at my dad's architect office. I, um, you know, as the baby of the family, I, I ended up kind of going on my own route and I went into IT. Um, and it was a little later in life that I, that I came back into real estate because of the clear advantages that I, I realized of, um, you know, tax, tax appreciation and, um, you know, all, all, all the things we love about real estate, especially all commercial real estate. Yeah. Um, so, but what I brought with that is when I rejoined real estate, I had been spent a bunch of years in, in technology. And so I'm a data geek. I, I love spreadsheets. I love data and I'm always looking at the numbers. Um, and not just for analyzing a deal, I always wanted to find the perfect markets. Hmm. Um, and that was such a struggle for me because I live in California. I always have been born and raised. And it's not the market I invest in. Yeah. So when you don't live where you're investing, how do you analyze that market? And I struggled with that for years as a, as a data geek. And then uh, when I met up with Neil Bawa and saw him presenting at a conference, I was like, this guy, I really get this guy. Like that just really <laughs> resonates with me, his whole approach, the way he talks about data. And so, um, so I took a boot camp from him. And that was the beginning of our journey. I, I started volunteering for him and then eventually working for him. And, and you know, now I serve as the vice president of the company. Um, but we, we together both have a tech background and both basically take data science and apply it to real estate. So, you know, what that means is we're, you know, obviously you can imagine numbers when you're analyzing a deal, but we don't even analyze deals that aren't in the market or micro neighborhoods that we would want to invest in. So we're looking at key metrics like, you know, jobs, population, median household income, um, poverty levels, unemployment levels, these types of things. And we're looking for what we call like the Goldilocks zone 
um, for each of those metrics. Um, and we're, we're not even going to analyze deals that aren't in those zones. So I think that's a differentiator for us. And it's a differentiator for our investors who invest with us because they, they know that we're doing the homework. We've got quantitative, um, you know, metrics to show them like, this is why we like this block. This is, you know, and uh, so we're not just saying, Hey, it's a good deal. You know, it's the returns are great. Well, we are looking for not just the returns are great, but the market fundamentals are substantial. So, um, you know, the economy is going to go up and down, but what you want is a market that's going to support you, even if the market's going down somewhat. If you have a strong market, it has room to go down. If you're in a market that's already at the bottom, where are you going to go? You know? Yeah, uh, I, I really like that. I, I'm a I'm kind of a data geek myself and, and uh, look at markets, uh, I think pretty similar to what you guys uh, do as well. And one thing I noticed during the recession um, is, and, and then the expansion beyond the recession is, you know, you could buy properties in markets that weren't maybe or neighborhoods that weren't fundamentally that strong and you could buy them for cheap and you could cash flow and uh, everything was fine there. But as things continue to improve, mm -hmm. those prices didn't nearly bounce back like- Right, you didn't have the appreciation. Yeah, you didn't have the appreciation. So when right. you look at, uh, you know, in, in the Minneapolis market, for instance, uh, we take a, a neighborhood uh, that's in more of like that C-class that just, just doesn't have that growth. And the properties may be increased, uh, but if you would have bought a property with a little bit less cash flow, uh, still still having cash flow, but a little less cash flow, you would have far exceeded the expectations of returns and, and the stability as well. Um, right. As the market goes up and down, those C neighborhoods are the ones to really, uh, I think, feel those impacts a lot quicker. And right. One of the things that we really focus on when we're looking at these C neighborhoods that does make a difference, you know, we, we as syndicators, we all talk about forced appreciation, right? Mm -hmm. What we want to do with a commercial real estate property is move the rents or basically move the net operating income. And yep. so we're, we're not necessarily relying on appreciation. We're going to take the, it in our own hands and the plan, the business plan is to force appreciation. Well, you, in order to force appreciation, um, in other words, you're talking about in, increasing rents or, you know, a lot of times it's, it's about increasing rents, not just reducing expenses. Well, your tenants have to be able to afford to in, the rent increase. So you have to look at the median household income and what is your tenant base to see, can they, can they actually pay the rent that I'm saying I'm going to move the rents to? And will they be able to pay their rents 12 months out of the year? Oh, yeah. And you know, so, so if you get in an area, for example, where the median household income is, you know, 28K or 24K, it's very common out there. It's, and, and you're charging, you know, $800 is, is going to be your average rent. There's a good chance they're not going to be able to pay you rent 12 months out of the year. And then you're going to have a lot of churn and you're going to have a lot of delinquency. So, so these are issues that can really get in the way of the profitability. You can forecast and project the numbers however you want, but you've got to run that business. And you've got to deliver returns for your investors. So by, by pre-looking at the underlying data to say, you know, what is, what is the median household income and will they be able to afford what we're projecting and then go from there. So that's, that's part of our Goldilocks zone. We typically look for median household income, no less than 38 K. So we're looking, you know, 40 K is kind of our, our average. Um, but we're not looking for median household incomes of hundred K. Because typically, uh, you know, in that type of scenario, or even 80K, the housing prices are going to be so expensive, unless you're in a, a, a pocket of the Bay Area, um, that uh, you're not going to be able to, your, your capital, your, your, you know, the, the cap rate is going to be so low, you won't yeah. be able to make any profit on the building. Yeah. So, you know, you have to consider all of the elements, but median household income is really crucial for us in how we, we pick those, those micro neighborhoods. And we're looking at, like, within a, just a few blocks. Of, of, you know, with, with, here's the property, here's the blocks around it, and what's the income in that area? 
Yeah, a couple of things I want to, you know, make sure we mention here, or that I mention again of what you just said, as you you said it twice now, is you're looking at blocks. You're not mm-hmm. looking at the whole city necessarily, and you might be looking. We at do. The we city. do. So right. we do we start by looking at the the overall metrics of the market. Yeah. And if we don't like the market, then you're going. We, we are not even looking at the neighborhood, right. and and so for overall market, we're looking at jo- you know the big ones of jobs and population. But um, as you uh, really dial into a property, mm-hmm. you're then dialing into that neighborhood. I'm assuming, right? Absolutely. And then you- we're looking at median household income, unemployment, poverty level, the very specific. You you know you you don't look at. Un- you know, like for unemployment, for example, we want to look at unemployment in that, that neighbor, that micro neighborhood. Yeah. And then we're going to compare it to the city to say, is the unemployment in this area, we only allow it to be 2% um, higher than the city's unemployment. Mm. If it's more than 2%, that's not good for us. Yeah. Uh, because you, you have to take a, you have to take a local perspective. You can't take the U.S. national, um, you know, for that for that metric, you can't look at the U.S. average. You need to look at a more localized average or, yeah. or metric. Um, so, so these are the types of Goldilocks elements that we look at. You don't want huge unemployment. However, um, you also have to take into consideration if there's a school nearby, um, or if it's a large retired community, because those can affect your unemployment rates, and it could be okay. So you could have a, a very large unemployment that's triggered by a return, you know, a large retirement community or a large student population. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense as well. Uh, I think it's, it's very important though, as we talk about this and you, you look at this data, how you said we're really narrowing it down and, and we're looking at all the points of the data. Um, we're looking at what's going on in that market in particular. You're looking at the city as a whole, but, a lot of people go, okay, I really like XYZ city. Uh, I, really, I like Dallas, Texas, for instance, because it's the hottest market in the world. But I like Dallas, Texas. But, but then they go and they, they just look everywhere in Dallas, Texas. That's right. And they assume that everything is equal in Dallas. And they just assume that that market is going to be good no matter where they're at. But that's not necessarily true. It's never true. There, yeah. There's never a, a market you could look at where every single block yeah. is a good block. It's not, yeah. not ever going to be true. Yeah. Yeah. And so we have to, as you have already said, really dig down and look in a neighborhood and specifically. And then the other thing I really like that you talked about is affordability mm-hmm. and what these tenants can actually afford versus what you're trying to charge for rent. Um, uh, I think so, so often we forget that one of the things that tenants need to do is be able to afford to actually pay their rent. That's right. And in a good economy, most people can afford it and they'll push their boundaries. But as the economy shifts, if you didn't pay attention to what Anna is saying, then you're going to have a challenge actually collecting those rents that you want to and need to get. That's right. Cool. Um, I love the data thing. So let's keep on talking. So where, where are you finding some of this data and how are you really picking it apart and, and making sure it's useful for what you need? Um, sure. Well, uh, one of the parts for our company, so Grow Capitus is, is our investing side of the house, and that's where we acquire large commercial properties, and, and, and with investor money, we purchase these properties. We've actually, in the past 10 months, acquired uh, over 1,000 units. Um, but there's also another side of the house, which is our education side of the house, so multifamily U um, is where we teach people how to be active investors and teach them about um, you know, all of these data metrics that, that Neil has kind of come up with and um, uses in, and then we use in our own portfolio. We teach boot camps and we also have a lot of free webinars that we do. So the reason I'm mentioning all this is to say, everything that I'm saying you can find um, through our free, um, there's a free Udemy course that Neil ca- taught on how to, uh, how to pick the best cities and neighborhoods in the US. And he walks you through the whole thing. It's a 90 minute free course on Udemy. So I definitely recommend you all find that because not only are you going to- That's on multifamily U. Well, it's connected from multifamily U, yes. 
but um, some people might want to go straight to Udemy. And okay. it's also, it's a free course on Udemy. And um, so you asked about the source of data and on there, we, what he did is he found free sources of data and then teaches people how to use those sources of data um, in order to, to get these metrics and what the metrics are you should be looking for. So um, many of you have heard of citydata.com before. You've probably used it. You've probably looked up stuff and said, ah, there's a lot of commercials. There's a lot of data here. But how do you use it? Yep. He's come up with a way to, to very specifically target the data that you need and gives you ratios for each of those, those things. And then the thing that I think was really brilliant is there's, there's a map on there. And it's kind of like this interactive data map. It's kind of like cool. It's like, oh, what do I do with this? And he shows you how to use that map and to dial the, the, the levers here and there. And, and um, within that, you can find the path of progress through the city. And how valuable is that? Because you don't want to invest in the war zones, but you don't want to invest in the, in the, the locations that are like too rich. You can't, you can't make your returns there. Where is that sweet spot? Mm -hmm. So by doing this technique and dialing it this way, dialing it that way, and then sampling the data, it's like a river that runs through the city that shows you the exact path of progress. And that's using free tools. So, so we, you know, it takes a little while, but once you know how to do it and you're investing, you're going to save so much time by buying the right, the right part of the city. So you're going to save yourself a ton of time that way. But what we use uh, on a regular basis as, as the lead underwriter of the, of the group, the two things I use that are paid tools is local market monitor, um, and that's a fantastic tool that analyzes markets. It's pulling and aggregating data from lots of different sources, and then it will rate the, the, the cities um, based on all kinds of different metrics. So I'm always looking, anytime somebody sends me a deal that they, 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 would, they would like us to partner with them on for equity, the very first thing I'm going to look at is I look at the address, and I'm going to pull up the market and see what's going on in that market. And it gives me a lot of different information about um, median household income and, and where, where things are. And then it gives me a, a rating for the city. The other thing that I look at for the micro neighborhood is using the address. I use neighborhood scout yep. uh, and, and neighborhood scout is a fantastic tool. Again, it's an, it's aggregating data from city data, you know, all of this public data that's out there and then layering on additional things. Um, so, so those are the paid tools that I use daily. Um, and then we also will do use the same city data technique to go in and look at the, um, the path of progress to see, you know, how it lays. Although Neighborhood Scout has its own way of kind of producing the information and, and scoring um, the area to tell you the appreciation potential of an area, as well as the past, uh, the past kind of the history of the area um, and, and how the appreciation has been over time. So, uh, so we look at that a lot. And then the other thing we look at these days, which is also a free thing that everybody should be looking at so they know what, uh, what they're investing in, is opportunity zone maps. Um, you can get those all over the internet. It's really easy right. to Google. You know, whatever city you are, there's tons of great maps out there. You should know, are you looking at an opportunity zone or not? You know, do you own already in an opportunity zone? It's an additional um, element that everybody should be aware of. And and you don't, just by buying in the opportunity zone, you're not automatically eligible for the tax benefits. Um, it, it takes, there's some things, there's some hoops you got to jump through. But uh, if you can jump those hoops, you can um, really create great wealth uh, for yourself as well as, you know, if you're using, have investors with you, you can um, have them defer a lot of capital gains and create a lot of wealth moving forward. So something you should always look at whenever you're acquiring a property is the opportunity zone map for that area. I want to hit on the opportunity zones in a little bit here. Um, but I want to just mention, you know, about what you're saying um, previously uh, on these websites and, and mm -hmm. getting this, this data. Um, great stuff there, by the way. Uh, so city data, um, the mapping, what you talked about with, with what you guys have at multifamily, you, uh, I think is fantastic because as you mentioned, 
when you can you can buy in a a C class neighborhood that uh, or even a B class neighborhood that doesn't have any growth that's just stale stagnant maybe even trending downward uh, and and you might be able to find a good deal there and cash flows really well today but if nothing positive is happening that property just continues to potentially even lose value. Uh, But if you're able to find where the emerging market is, find where that path of progress is going, now you have an opportunity to really create some real true growth and wealth, Mm -hmm. not only your rent growth, but your appreciation of your property. And that's the golden, that's the golden goose, right? That it's just the golden goose. And that's what data can teach us. So that, yeah. that's what's so exciting to me yeah. is using data to understand the path of progress because that's, yeah. that's what we're all looking for, right? Yeah, that's the exciting you know? part. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so so let's, let's hit quick, real quick on the opportunity zones. You mentioned the opportunity zones, so I don't want to pass by them. Um, first of all, some of our listeners may not know too much about them. So maybe give us a, a little rundown of what they are and uh, again, why? Why should we even care? Yeah. Um, sure. Well, I'll talk about them a little bit from the investor side as well as from um, the active, from the active and passive uh, investor side. Cool. So, first of all, what is an opportunity zone? Um, opportunity zones are census tracts that uh, the income um, is is lower in those areas. We might consider them to be distressed areas. So, compared to the census tracts around them they have lower median household income and, and just are, you know, are, are in worse condition. So what happened in the 2017 Jobs Act, there was a portion of the Jobs Act that was um, passed, in the, which is the Opportunity Zones. And what they did is they are trying to free up capital gains that they feel people are holding on to because they don't want to pay taxes on those capital gains. So the program is designed so that First of all, they I had the state governors identify the census tracts in each state that would be um, vote, you know, would be proposed to be the opportunity zones, and then they had to be certified by the U.S. Treasury. That process created eighty over eighty seven hundred opportunity zones in the U.S. Okay, so the intent is now for um, capital gains to be invested into these opportunity zones and for these communities to then be developed and to come up to the standard of the, uh, the census tracts or the neighborhoods around them. That is, that is the goal, and it's a fantastic goal um, that will help not only investors, but also communities. So how does that work for the investor, and how does that work for the, the owner of the property? So let's, let's talk about the investor first. If you have capital gains, first of all, you could bring capital gains from from many different sources. It's not just real estate. You can bring capital gains from sales of stock, from sales of an antique car, from sales of artwork, any, you know, almost any kind of uh, sale of a business, almost any type of capital gain that you can imagine qualifies. What you would need to do is, is put it into the opportunity zone within 180 days of that gain being recognized. So it doesn't have to be the next day. You have up to 180 days to invest it. And then you invest it into an opportunity zone fund, um, which can be a single property, by the way. It doesn't always mean more than one property. That's just the, the, the nomenclature for what it is. But we'll, we'll talk about it as a single property. So you have to invest it into that property within 180 days. Then you get the three advantages of opportunity zone investing. The first is that you get deferral. So if you do not have to pay your capital gains tax on that transaction for seven years if you invested in 2019. Basically, it's 2027 taxes that, sorry, it's 2026 taxes that you're paying in 2027. So if you were to invest it now, you would have seven-year deferral. If you invest next year, then you have six-year deferral. So it depends on what year, but the 2027 is the year you'd be paying the capital gains tax. Now here's the second part. There's also forgiveness. So we had deferral, now we have forgiveness. The forgiveness part is the longer you have uh, before that you have to pay, you get a step down in the basis of your capital gains. Instead of paying 100%, if you have seven years, then you only pay 85% of the capital gains that you would have owed. If you get down to five years, then you pay 10%. 10%. 
of the capital gains. So kind of step down. And eventually you don't get any of the forgiveness. You just get the deferral. Okay. So those are two pretty nice things that people are like, yeah, that's great. I don't have to pay my, my capital gains tax until, you know, in the future. But the big thing is for investors, if you hold that asset or you're invested in that, that opportunity zone asset for 10 years and a day, then you, the, the growth, the appreciation on that investment, the capital gains you would get on the sale of that investment is tax-free forever. So once you sell it, those capital gains from that asset, you pay no taxes on, on the federal level. No federal taxes are due at all. And that can be a huge amount of money. Uh, in fact, I think that I think it's that for every hundred dollars that you invest, if you invested in a traditional um, portfolio versus an opportunity zone, the um, and and you get both had the same, I think, ten percent appreciation, et cetera, then you would have forty four dollars more in the you would have gained forty five dollars forty four dollars more for every one hundred dollars in the opportunity zone. Not bad is very, very significant. <laughs> it's very significant. Yeah. 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 So, um, so that's, so, so that's fantastic. So I'm sure um, the investors in the group are all jumping up and down and saying, how do I get me some of that? So yeah. here's what you have to do from the active investor side. If you are buying an opportunity zone project or, or a, a property within an opportunity zone, you, of course, of course you need to, to buy it, but let's, so you have to buy it. And then in order for it to be eligible, you have to bring in a lot of capital to improve the property. Well, how much capital do you have to bring in? The ratio that is, the formula that, that the government has come up with is the value of the building or the buildings on the property is the amount that you need to bring in in capital to improve the asset. So for example, if you had a million dollar property that you purchased, and $250,000 was deemed land and $750,000 was deemed buildings, then you would have to bring in an additional $750,000 in capital to improve the buildings. And you have to improve the buildings within 30 months. So, mm -hmm. so you, there's a time frame. There, it's not like, you remember, you've got to hold it for 10 years, right? But you can't be like, oh, this is cool. I'll just bring in $50,000 a year or seven, you know, $75,000 a year and I'll, I'll meet my objective. No, the plan, you need to improve it right away, uh, you know, 30 months to improve. So yeah. right there, a lot of people are like, ouch, that's, how do I do that? Now yeah. for us, that means most opportunity zone projects are not value add syndication type projects because you can't bring in enough capital. There's not enough, you're gonna be over improving the project. So, you know, we like to say you, there's not enough lipstick you can put on that pig, you know? So instead of, unless you buy land that has like a little house on it and you're going to scrape it um, or a, an apartment building that has room in the back. Um, but in both of those cases, we're talking about new construction. We're not talking about renovating kitchens and raising rents. Right, we're talking right. about new construction. So that's something that people need to understand as well, that, you know, unless you can get your ratios right where you are just improving versus ground up construction, um, the majority of opportunity zone um, projects will be new construction. Um, so for us, that's, that's great or that, that's not an issue because in our portfolio, we have quite a few ground up construction projects. So that is within our wheelhouse and uh, we're very confident and we actually love ground up construction. We've got uh, two um, projects we're doing in New York that are ground up construction and another one that's just launching in St. George, Utah. So, um, so, you know, so that works for us. But we, we always, I always find that investors are not aware that Opportunity Zone has these requirements. They're all excited about it. And then when they understand what needs to happen, they're like, I don't know how I can make that work, you know? Yeah. But I would encourage people to look at it and look at creative financing. Um, you might be able to make it work and partnering with the right people. You know, we partner with developers and not just any developer, but developers who have uh, experience with holding an asset. You can't partner with a developer who then is going to sell the project right, right after they make it because that's what right. developers do, right? They, they build something and then they sell it and then go. 
Well, that won't satisfy the opportunity zone because they have to hold for 10 years. Yep. And then if they're going to hold for 10 years, they need to have the experience holding. Um, so yeah, there's a few, there's definitely a few gotchas that, that uh, whether you're investing or buying in opportunity zones, you need to consider. We have a, uh, um, a, a booklet, an ebook that we put together called the five perils of opportunity zones that talks about peril, the different perils and how to avoid them. So um, actually I, I can, people can get access to that ebook if they um, text five perils to 44222. So the number five, P-E-R-I-L-L-S, P-E-R-I-L-S to 44222. And then that you'll get a, an ebook that will walk you through the, the do's and don'ts and things to look out for as an active, um, active or passive investor in opportunity zones. Awesome. And that's opportunity zones. Awesome. Well, that was uh, very detailed and man, you went through that really quick, which is awesome. <laughs> I'll so, have to talk more about it. I can talk about the, you know, the perils. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. No, but that, that was great. That was probably the uh, most detailed and just like very, very concise. I mean, you, you didn't spend a lot of time on it, but you were really detailed and I appreciate that. And, and people can CPA, listen back. My CPA even says that I know more about opportunity zones than they do. And they're, they're like, you know, the bigger pot, they're, they're like fantastic real estate CPAs. And uh, they referred me to speak at an Opportunity Zone meetup when they were invited. They're like, you don't want us, you want her. You know? I, I feel like I went to a, a half a day uh, Opportunity Zone uh, meeting, right? And they talked about yeah. the Opportunity Zones. I feel like in the five minutes that you talked about Opportunity Zones, I learned more in those five minutes than I did in that entire meeting. So congratulations. Yeah, well, thank you. That's great. Yeah, <laughs> we're all about opportunity zones. We're, we're very actively pursuing uh, projects and, and we apply the same type of data filters to the way we look at OZs and, and OZ census tracts. Yeah. Um, it's, it's just uh, another, you know, it, they're slightly different, of course, because they're areas that naturally have lower income, right? Yeah. So we have to look at it in a different way. Um, but, uh, there's out of the 8,700 uh, opportunity zones out there, 19% of them are in already gentrifying areas. Yeah. So that's one thing to know that so you don't have to buy in a distress, what we consider a distressed area or a war zone. Not all OZs are like that. There's, yep. there's opportunity zones in downtown Phoenix. There's yep. opportunity zones in San Jose, California, you know? So yeah, we've so, got an opportunity zone right by the mall of America. Yeah. yeah. And, and do you look at it and go like, are you kidding me? Yeah. Like, it's not, how did this happen? Right. 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 So, and that's, that's the important thing that I've understood from a lot of people is for one, they're, they're not all in, in these bad areas that you consider to be, the, you know, the ghetto or whatever you want to call them. They're not mm -hmm. necessarily all in these terrible areas. Mm -hmm. uh, they are sometimes in gentrifying areas. And the other thing is, most deals, uh, from what I've been told, most deals in opportunity zones don't work. And right. just, just like a normal market, you have to sift through a lot of deals in order to find a deal that actually works. That's right. And then you got to know what to do with it. Now that you know, you've got to bring all that, that capital in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then if it's a class, if it is a class C area, you have to think, uh, I don't want to build a class A building in a class C area. Right. It, it's going to be a mismatch. Yep. Um, but maybe self storage would be a great match for some mm. of these areas. If it's not, you know, if the, if the income is lower, people might not mind um, having their self storage in an area that has lower income, but they don't want to live there. So, so uh, there are certain asset classes. It doesn't have to be residential, right? There's the different yeah, types of point. asset classes that could be a great match. The cannabis industry can be a really good match. Yeah. Um, it's not something we currently invest in, but um, there's different. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, residential real estate. Uh, yeah, in fact, point. Uh, we're. I am not an expert on it, but but you can also invest in opportunity zone businesses, yeah. and that's something our audience would have to look up on their own because I'm I'm all about real estate, but um, that's also something that can happen in in opportunity zones is the business side of it. Yeah. And the businesses, uh, from what I understand, have 
uh, even more some 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 better perks and and even more perks. Um, so that's definitely something to look into if, if you're interested in that. Um, and I like that you you detailed the length of time and, and these opportunities don't sound like they work if you're going to hold it for 10 years. If you're not going to hold it for 10, yeah, 10 years yeah. in a day. If, if you're not going to hold it for 10 years in a day, yeah, they do okay. But 10 years in a day, they do really well. Cause not really, really well. well. Yeah, because now yeah. you don't have to 1031 exchange. You can sell it and you've got tax-free gain. Yeah, from a federal yeah. perspective, it's tax-free. Yeah. You need to look at your state taxes. Your state tax, which... So, so you can look that up online. There's, yeah. you know, it's the, the, there's a map. And who knows, you know, many of them might turn around, but you might have to pay your state tax, your state version of the capital gains right sure. away. Sure. So you do need to speak to your CPA about it, you know, when you're, when you're going, like, what is the best path? 1031s on the other side, most states are in alignment with the federal, you know, the, the, the feds True. and the states are in alignment on 1031s. So yeah. I have a whole 1031 versus OZ shoot off that I do. Um, but I have to tell you, I'm, uh, I'm a huge 1031 fan myself. Yep. I've uh, probably done about seven of them so far in my life. And uh, it's been a huge wealth um, builder for, for my family generationally and, and myself. Um, and in fact, I'm such a believer in 1031s. I have um, in, uh, invested enough time to be able to figure out with the help of, of other professionals how to 1031 into a syndication. Mm -hmm. And so that is something that we are offering now. So not only, so we're all about tax deferral. So we, are, we, are, we have OZ projects that we're offering to investors. And we also have 1031 eligible projects. Not, they can't be the same thing because you can't 1031 into an opportunity zone. Right. But we have syndications that we're doing that are 1031 eligible. So people that want to be passive investors, but want to be on a larger, you know, a larger building, um, they don't want to mess around with single families or small multis anymore. They can 1031 into a, a, a large syndication. Yeah. And that's something you hear that uh, most people say, well, you just can't do that. You can't 1031 because it's that's what I was heard. That's yeah, what I it's always the light heard kind of exchange. Like, right. Yes. In, in However, school. yes. But you can. So, so I'm not somebody to give up easily when, you know, I always heard the same thing. And of course, I understand the structure of a syndication. And the reason you can't, uh, with, a, with a standard syndication, you can't um, 1031 into it because you're, the, you're buying into an LLC. You're buying yep. shares in an LLC that aren't in your name. It's in the name of the LLC. And that, thus, yep. it's not a like-kind exchange. However, once you incorporate a tick structure, into the syndication structure. So you have the tick, the tenant in common structure, as well as the investor LLC, yep. and they both um, have, you know, have shares in the overall syndication. Now you have a structure that 1031 people can come into because the tenant in common structure is like kind exchange according to 1031. Awesome, awesome, good stuff. Hey, let's take a minute to thank our sponsor, Pine Financial Group. Look, you work hard for your money. Is your money working hard for you? Because of inflation, money sitting idle erodes your wealth. Many investors understand that real estate is a great investment, but may not want the effort or the risk that comes with owning their own property. They want to sit back and have payments, hit their bank account each and every month. Stop eroding your wealth and start building it by asking your money to work for you. You should be earning profits while you sleep in investment backed by real estate. Pine Financial Group, the leader in hard money lending in Colorado and Minnesota, was recently approved to offer their investment publicly. This investment offers only for investors in Colorado and Minnesota and is only made through the investment prospectus. Get your copy today. Simply visit www.pineinvestments.com and click to get started. There's a reason why some of the wealthiest people in history invest in loans backed by real estate. Learn more about the risks and returns at www.pineinvestments.com. It's www.pineinvestments.com. I want to invite you to join us at the North Star Real Estate Conference. This conference is September 20 and 21st in Minneapolis, and it's going to be packed full of a ton of great speakers. We've got uh, 
just a, a great group of people speaking. You can look at our lineup on our website, nreconference.com, and sign up there as well. We've got an early bird special. All you need to do is type in early bird, one word, and uh, you can get $100 off. And that's good through August 10th. So make sure you sign up now. Take action. Look, people that take action and value their education are those who are going to succeed. I know there's a lot of free content. My podcast is free. There's all kinds of free content out there, maybe even free meetups that you're attending. But this conference is going to blow your socks off. This is going to be well worth the price and all the profits go to charity. So it's definitely time to take action. Sign up now. Don't delay because the prices will go up. Um, but you know what? Every time I attend a conference, I 10x. Actually, I would say I more like a thousand X even my investment, a hundred, a thousand, potentially even more X my investment. I've met so many fantastic people. I've met investors at conferences. I've met potential partners at conference. I've joined mastermind groups because of conferences. So it's a ton of value. You cannot replace it. So check it out. NREconference.com. Thanks a lot. Um, we're, we're kind of running up on time, but I want to go back to the data and, and ask you, is there any, anything else uh, in the data that you want to, you know, talk to our listeners about? Is there anything else that you really uh, think is important for them to understand? Sure. Um, we talked a lot about data from the acquisition side. And I want to also highlight that, that it's important to use data when you're running your business. Because uh, you know, once you buy once you buy a buy a business, once you buy a multifamily or a commercial piece of property, the, the game is just starting. That's not the end of the game. Mm, and so we important. we use uh, a lot of data techniques um, to optimize our property. And um, so we are uh, we have a, a Monday morning report, which many many people have that our property manager delivers to us on a weekly basis on Monday morning. And, um, and delivers us the metrics of, of all the, you know, the, the vacancy, the occupancy, you know, the upcoming notice to vacates, uh, the evictions. And so we have this kind of mashup um, that's a dashboard that we're able to really see all of the data and all of the trends. And I think that's critical that, that you always have the pulse on your, um, your business and having the data at your fingertips is, is very key. Um, then the other thing that we do is we ha use technology to optimize. One of the things we do is we, we drive leads to our properties. And the, the point of leads, if for those of you that aren't familiar with asset managing, is we um, there's advertisements that your property manager typically creates uh, through their property management software, Yardi or Appfolio. They kind of push a button and it pushes ads out to the sites that are associated. And most property managers are like, good, I've done my job. I've got ads on the internet. Well, for us, that's not good enough. So we have a, a staff, we have a virtual army is what we like to call them, um, that basically uh, a section of this virtual army is responsible for mega marketing. And what that means for us is that they are creating ads and in ways that um, are completely legal, but are utilizing the system in, in ways that we're kind of tricking the system so there's more advertisements going out there on specific channels and what and then we're driving leads to our property managers way above what they're doing so for example we had one property where the the weekly the property manager was driving i think it was like 19 to 20 leads per week um, into this property and once we turned on mega marketing we drove 189 per week in addition to the property. Wow. So what does that do when you, when you generate all those leads? It's going to, first of all, it's going to help you fill up your building. Yeah. And it's also going to help you fill up your building with quality tenants. If you want to, we always talk about turning our tenant base, right? Well, if you're turning your tenant base with the 10 leads that are coming in, you don't have a lot to pick and choose from It all done within the laws. Of course, I'm not encouraging anyone to break the, the laws of, of, of how you choose tenants. But when you have a lot more people coming in, 
there's just a lot more tenants um, that are presenting themselves to you. Yeah. Okay. Um, now we also look at data and, and we're all about metrics. So we look at the data and we say, how many leads are coming in per week? That's the L. And then we, we look at the ratios to get to leases. So from leads to leases, you've got leads to applications, app, or sorry, leads to appointments. And we, we, we track how many appointments get made from appointments to shows, so how many people actually show up for those appointments, from shows to applications, how many people that we showed it to actually create applications, and then finally, of those applications, how many generated leases. So that's what we call our LASAL system, L-A-S-A-L. And um, so that's, an, again, another way we're using data to track our metrics and we see where the problem is. Uh, so we've got all these leads, how many leases are being generated? Well, it's, there's, there's many places that could be breaking down, right? We, we, we're, people are, people are uh, making appointments, but they're not showing up. Well, why aren't they showing up? How can we solve that? Oh, let's send them text messages. Let's send them two text messages to encourage them to show up. So, so, so we're always tweaking, tweaking, tweaking. In order to tweak, in order to optimize, you need data. You need data to be able to make decisions. And that's what we're all about is, is being able to just really having our eyes on what's going on and being innovative and being real thought leaders out there about how we're going to handle that data. And that is, a, I think, a huge advantage to our, our investors is, is the way that we're, all, we're never satisfied with just the status quo and the, the systems that are out there. We're always pushing for more. Yeah, if you don't know it's broke, you won't know how to fix it. That's right. right. And you guys are always using data to find out what's broke and what's not working, and then you're going to fix it and be able to have solutions to it. And yeah, and just look for trends. You know, sometimes yeah. it's not broken; it's a trend that's on the horizon, and you're yeah. like, "Oh, this doesn't look good. And yeah. We need to do something about this because this is going. This is trending the wrong direction, yeah. Yeah. right? But you yeah. don't have a problem yeah. yet." But if you're not looking at your data, you don't even realize it's coming your way, you right. know? Yeah. yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. I love it. Um, okay. So we are going to wrap up. I've got a couple last questions I need to ask you. First of sure. all, what's your favorite business or real estate book? Well, my favorite um, book on syndication, um, I think that is, is just really well done. Uh, is by Joe Fairless and Theo Hicks. Um, what is it? The best ever syndication book, I think it's called. Yep. Yeah. I, I, I think that that book is just a phenomenally well done. So for anyone wants is interested in being an active investor, that's, that's the book you should read first, I believe. I agree. It's a good book and it's put in a, a pretty plain language, which I yeah. like. I feel like some of the other syndication books that I've read you fall asleep too. Yeah. Or, and a lot of them just get caught up in trying to be so gooey fooey and, and, you know, there's not enough real content there. Yep. Whereas in, in this best ever syndication book, it, there is a, so much content and I know, and you know, as syndicators, what they're saying is the real stuff. They're not, it, it's the correct information, you know, yep. that's how we do stuff. And so that yep. was so, so impressive to me. They're not trying to sell me a boot camp. They're not trying to sell me coaching. They're just giving us the right, you know, what we, you know, the, here's the steps to how you do this. Yeah. And I think that's rare out there. And I, I, I applaud them for, for what they did. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Good. Definitely good book. Um, last question. What are your three pillars of wealth creation? Mm, okay. Tax deferral. Mm. We're all about tax deferral. I think if you're, if you're paying, you know, if you're not watching your bottom line with your taxes, a lot of money is going out the window. Um, hard work. It takes, it's, it takes a lot of hard work to, to build wealth, you know, to set up your pillar, to, to create the foundations of your pillars. And uh, people, you know, never forget, it's all about human beings and people. And, uh, if you keep that in mind and you keep, well, I'm going to throw the earth in there too. If you keep the earth and people in mind as you're building your wealth, you won't be um, a lonely, sour person once you have your wealth <laughs> that has, is living in like a, a, a 
terrible place. <laughs> I like it. Remember who and what is important. Yeah, remember who is what important. So when you have those pillars of wealth, and as you build those pillars of wealth, you know, maintain ethics and um, that are uh, be ethically responsible to humans and the earth. Cool. Awesome. I love it. Well, Anna, I appreciate you joining us on the show. How can our listeners get in touch with you, learn more about what you guys have going on? Um, sure. Well, multifamilyu.com is a great place for you to come check out a lot of free webinars. I, I co-host lots of webinars. I also teach underwriting on there. Free, free stuff for people to uh, come check us out. For example, we've got CoStar. Uh, I'm hosting, um, I, they're, we're going to be hosting them four times. So by the time this comes out, uh, but tonight, tonight I'm hosting at, uh, Atlanta um, expert on, from CoStar. There's more markets coming in the future. We have syndication lawyers. We've got all kinds of people coming on cost segregation, uh, CPAs, et cetera. So lots of content for people. And uh, so that's multifamilyu.com. And you can reach me at Anna at multifamilyu.com. I think those were are good ways to reach me. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I appreciate it, Anna. And uh, thanks for a, just a ton of awesome value you've added to our listeners. I definitely appreciate that. It was fun. I could yeah. probably keep talking for another like two hours about that. I, I hope we run into each other soon because I, I love <laughs> We could just have data like time. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have data time. We'll have like a regular data check-in. <laughs> Perfect. I <laughs> uh, appreciate it. Have a fantastic rest of the day. You too. A special thanks to Anna Myers for joining us on the show. Appreciate her spending time with us. And a couple of things I took from this episode. First of all, she talks about using data to run the business. And, uh, you know, Monday morning reports with data, just ha having data and uh, using it to... Um, make sure the fundamentals are strong, make sure the business is strong. And then she talks about having always having a pulse on your business as well, understanding where the business is at. Uh, the last thing she talks about is uh, making sure you take care of people and the earth and making sure you remember who and what is important. Um, so again, great having Anna on here. Um, fun conversation with her about data and how it can be used in the opportunity zones as well. So uh, lots of fun. Appreciate her joining us and you have a fantastic rest of the day. Make every day a Saturday. Hey, thanks for listening to the show. A couple things before we go again, go on to our Facebook page, Pillars of Wealth.